Go ahead and get us uh, call this meeting to order the Housing and Human Services Advisory Board meeting for August 13th, 2020. Our first uh, agenda item is public invited to be heard. Do we have any public to be heard? No, Vice Chair, nobody reached out to participate. Okay, thank you. Next up, we need to approve uh, the minutes from the July 9th and the July 23rd meetings. Do we have any discussion or correction on those minutes? And if not, I will entertain a motion to go ahead and approve this. I'll move to approve the minutes. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none. Question is approval of the minutes of the July 9th and 23rd Housing and Human Services Advisory Boards. All those in favor, raise your hand. Okay. Awesome. Any opposed? Okay. Fantastic. And All right. Uh, first up. Uh, Jake, on hang on one sec. Yeah. To confirm, was that motioned by Deanna and seconded by Graham? Yes. Okay. I apologize. I was turned this way and I missed the voice. It's all, right. it's all good. It was Deanna and Graham. Good catch. Thank good catch, you. Nicole. All right. Next up, uh, review and comment on the 2020 Human Services Needs Assessment Report and discuss uh, the 2021 agency funding schedule. Karen, is this you or is this Alberto? It is Alberto. All right, Alberto, take it away, my friend. Vice Chair and um, Board, let me, I'm going to share my screen here. I have a PowerPoint for tonight. Give me a second. So did everybody get the entire thing read? <laughs> All 158 pages? All 158 pages? <laughs> All right. All right, so we will move to the, we'll move through this um, quickly, but I want to make sure that you all have, if you have questions, you can stop me. Um, I will say up front, this is based on an executive summary that Karen and I just got and you will receive uh, as well, but we, we just recently got it ourselves and I based this PowerPoint on that executive summary um, document. All right. So just a little background for those that are new back in, so in 2018, the, the board decided to align the human services needs assessment with the five year comp plan that is required by HUD for CBDG funding. Got that right that time? Um, and so that, that happens every five years. And in the past, we have been doing independent human service needs assessments apart from the five-year plan. So we decided to leverage the work that was happening and, and really align these because there's a lot of similarities. There is also a human service need component in the comp plan. It's just not as in depth as what we did. Um, and so we contracted with the same agency doing the comp plan to do a little more in-depth um, uh, HSNA uh, report for us. Uh, and as a reminder, there's, there's a lot of sources of data in the human service needs assessment. Uh, back in February, March, we were really promoting, and I think this board helped promote a resident survey. We got over 1,100 uh, responses. I will say that's, most, that's the most that this survey was Boulder County-wide, and we, we Longmont received the most um, responses of all the others uh, participate or the other agencies participating in it. Um, and they've also looked at other local needs assessment. And of course they looked, they had um, multiple focus groups, both stakeholders, and those are primarily um, nonprofit leaders and city staff. And of course they did one with the board and also they did several with um, residents. And finally, I think it's important to note that this uh, human services needs assessment did take into account and primarily via conversation with the resident focus groups and stakeholder focus groups, uh, information about how COVID is impacting the needs of our community. So I wanna make sure that that, that, is, um, that, that that is acknowledged, they did take that into account. So here I'm gonna go through the identified needs uh, and I'm gonna go through them based on our current priorities. Our current priorities, as you may or may not remember, uh, are based on the social determinants of health, 
uh, these six we are using, so housing stability, health and well-being, food and nutrition, self-sufficiency and resilience, education and skill building, and safety and justice. And these also came out of our uh, 2016 human services needs assessment, I think, uh, but they're aligned with the social determinants of health. And so when they did the, the, this, this human services need assessment, they took into account these priorities and, 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 and some of the, the data they collected, they associated, um, and some of the focus groups they worked on, they made sure that these things were brought up. Um, so now I'm gonna jump into some of their findings. Um, I need to, hold on, I can't see, I need to minimize my video here, here you go. Um, so some of, the, uh, some of the areas in housing stability, what we're seeing of course, uh, is that housing instability has been amplified. Uh, by COVID, as people have lost their jobs, um, losing sources of income, it has become harder. Uh, and you know, there's a growing need for more rent and utility subsidies. Uh, for example, we just found out, or a, a few weeks ago, we found out that the R Center received $100,000 from the Energy Outreach Colorado, and the city is partnering with the R Center to help uh, folks that are back that have uh, back pay on the utilities to kind of get them caught up. Um, and then another finding was that cost burden households are giving up other basic needs. Uh, and they, sh they, give an, they give an example in another place they also talked about uh, co cost burden households, um, also for foregoing uh, dental and other type of mental, uh, mental and, and physical health care in order to cover uh, housing costs, which of course is something that we don't want to see. And, and you, board, you can stop me anytime you have a question about the findings. Or Karen as well. So on the self-sufficiency um, and resilience priority findings, and they looked and they said single mothers unemployed and with children under five and adult residents without high school degrees are twice as likely to live in poverty. And COVID is likely to just push these families deeper into financial difficulty. And this is where I mentioned uh, in order to paying housing costs, uh, low-income residents are are going without dental care or e car repairs or other types of care that they need. Um, and the, the COVID-19 unemployment spike uh, will further diminish their ability to reach self-sufficiency. So then they, they said that those folks in Longmont who were already in poverty had an unemployment rate 10 times higher than residents above the poverty threshold before the pandemic. Uh, and I think that we, we understand the pandemic has really hit uh, the type of work that uh, it is in person, for example, the, the food service area, um, and, and that has caused folks to um, fall deeper into financial um, struggles. Uh, on the food and nutrition, they talk about the, the fact that um, more than two in five uh, low and moderate incomes with children, um, and one in three respondents who are precariously housed uh, are experiencing or reducing going without food in 2019. I can tell you that in what we have learned um, during this pandemic in conversations with Community Food Chair, they've seen tremendous growth in need as well. But one of the, one of the, the consequences of this pandemic is in the past, Community Food Chair uh, tried to do and did, a, I think did a good job of allowing people to kind of shop through their, to their site, making it feel very um, consumer, consumer driven, consumer choice. Uh, but due to safety concerns, uh, now folks are getting prepared, pre-prepared boxes uh, at the R Center at um, Community Food Share just to make sure that people are safe. In the health and well-being area, our uh, priority you know, we're seeing an increase in isolation and loneliness. Um, all of these, these mental health issues uh, because of the, the need to self quarantine or be, a, you know, social distance are having a toll or taking a toll and having an issue. There's also a perceived lack of mental health services, whether due to the lack of hours or, or, or just lack of service. And then they said that there's an estimated 3,700 adults that have a serious mental illness in Longmont. On the education and skill building side, their findings were really primarily around the, the child care crisis that we're seeing around providers. You know, providers are finding it difficult to provide the kind of care that is 
the business um, that allows them to maintain their business, right? They can't serve as many. It's more expensive to provide PPE. Um, and so, you know, they're, they're struggling. So we're seeing, we're seeing providers close shop. Um, and that's also putting a strain on programs like Head Start and CCAP. I think what I understand from Head Start is their, their applications doubled uh, for this upcoming um, school year, Head Start year. Um, and this is, this is an unknown, we don't know exactly what's gonna happen, but there's definitely gonna be issues if schools remain online only or just hybrid and online learning uh, and who is getting impacted by that, right? Who, uh, and, and there's a lot of equity issues that we need to consider uh, when, when schools go online or, or hybrid. So those are some of the things that we are seeing in education and skill building. In safety and justice, um, low-income households are, who are renters or precariously housed um, are more likely to, than others to respond to have safety concerns about their neighborhood. Um, and then during the focus group, they, the residents and stakeholders discussed three types of safety and justice needs, uh, capacity building for law enforcement around engaging with residents with disabilities and mental illness. I know that's a conversation that we've had at this board, uh, concern about the impact of COVID shutdowns on child abuse and domestic violence. I think Anne can speak to that. Um, and then of course, the racial and ethnic tensions stirred by the federal policy decisions and um, the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis. And, and, and we, of course, this board uh, has had several, several really amazing conversations on this, uh, on this issue. So those are the ones that we, um, that are part of our current priorities. There were some also other findings that they, um, they, they looked at and they identified some gaps that are not necessarily specific to our current priorities, but we've talked about. Uh, one, of course, is, is digital inclusion or the digital divide. Uh, as this world becomes more virtual, uh, again, an inequity issue of those that have access uh, not only to internet capable devices, but internet and also digital literacy, able to, even if they have the internet and the device, can they use it? Uh, and then they also talked about case management capacity. Um, I can, you know, as, uh, as we go through this, um, they talked about families and individuals needing more support as they work through these issues uh, and how stretched our agencies are. I can tell you that up to now, up to recently, the Art Center is pretty stretched. They were, they were seeing people about a month out. Um, they were scheduling people a month out. They have hired two new resource specialists, we'll hope, which will hopefully help with that. But there's definitely a need for, the, for, for case management capacity. But that's not been a part of our priorities. Um, so, but they did identify those gaps. And they also talked about some other things to consider. For example, residents who are immigrants uh, and the, the additional difficulties that they're, that they're having to access resources, not only due to a lack of language, but fear of the public charge, um, uh, you know, concern about having to share a lot of information with our agencies or our gov local governments. So there, there's a lot of, of, of challenges that, that folks who are uh, immigrants. And of course, residents with disabilities don't experience the same level of inclusion and they're more isolated during this time. Uh, and this was even, even true before COVID and COVID has just exacerbated that issue. Um, and then finally, they, they talk about it, that the difficulty that residents and um, stakeholders may have to find information about the program or services that are available in long months. And, and that's not new. Uh, I think that COVID has, um, COVID has uh, you know, in, increased that, that, that challenge. There's a lot of resources out there and it's hard to find them. And if you, have, if you throw in the digital divide, because many of these resources are available online, uh, it makes it even more difficult for folks to find. So the human service needs assessment also provided some recommendations. Sorry to interrupt, Eliberto. Someone, I think. Yeah, oh. that's fine. I, I can't see. If you guys are trying to raise your hand. Oh, got it. There was someone waiting to get in. Sorry. Oh, okay. Did we, did we take Hi, care of that? Ryan. I'm in. Ah, Ryan's in. All right. Fearless leader. All right. Thank you, Brian. I'll get you renamed. <laughs> 
You survived okay, the, thank you. the refrigerator truck. Hey, Eliberto, yeah. this is Shakita. I have a question. Um, um, as I was reading that, um, that entire long, um, <laughs> I didn't read the whole 159 pages, but probably 120. But um, they also was, were discussing, it was mentioning about our seniors, the right. senior population. So I was kind of interested. I didn't see that. I see that, you know, um, I didn't see that under that last slide. I was kind of wondering why we didn't see. I mean, they're isolated as well. Right. So um, do we, what do we, why weren't they on that page? Uh, probably because it wasn't, it, or either I didn't see it in the executive summary, because uh, it's more high level and they might have, uh, so it's more like that's why, or I just missed it, so. Okay. Um, I was just checking because I know, so, which was very interesting. And, you know, we want to make sure that we take care of our seniors as well. Right. Right, that's true. So, thank you. I might have, I might have stayed high level. For example, that case management might have included seniors in the summary, and I didn't. And I didn't. I just took the the heading and not the whole, the whole thing. So, oh, that makes sense. Yeah, so, yeah. Any other questions before we jump into some of their recommendations? All right, I'm gonna minimize. So I can't see you all. So just go ahead and speak up because I'm, in order for you to see, I need to minimize the, the video. So I'm gonna keep going. So they, not only did they provide you know, these findings and they identified some gaps, they also have some recommendations. We're gonna go through them as well. Uh, and those are in the larger document as well. So first and foremost, they, they, they talk about continuing and strengthening the existing programs and services, right? Um, now, what's interesting about this, and, and we can have more conversation, right? So, of course, we've been doing the housing stability. We've been doing access to childcare. Um, I mean, the, the preparing for provider closures is new. Um, and so is the, the, the reality of school closures and that impact. Uh, but also something new is, and something that we've not done in the past is, at least not directly, is, is proactively support employment. In particular, because that you know that typically has been a workforce we have boulder county workforce and that's been kind of where that that kind of lives in that area so i'm not exactly sure and i think this is part of our conversation how we how we do this um how whether or whether we do this or or accept this recommendation only because like i said we we do have a robust workforce in boulder county um doing a lot of wonderful programs they also emphasize the no wrong door approach to human services intake. Um, you know, and again, kind of we, we talked about earlier, just the, the difficulty in accessing and navigating services is, um, is difficult. You know, we, Karen and I have had this conversation at the Boulder County Funders Collaborative, and this has been an issue for uh, many, many, many years. Um, and, not, and not to say that we, we shouldn't address it, but more to say that this is something that is bigger than Longmont. Um, and uh, we could try and do our part potentially, I mean, it's for the board for us to discuss, but not sure exactly how the human services funding piece would fit into this. Um, but we could have a conversation about that. Um, and those gaps they identified, so they, you know, the mental health piece, they, they said, here's some suggestions. How do you increase the walk-in mental health crisis service? So like right now, the only mental, and um, we were just did a site visit with, with mental health partners and they actually, their, their uh, crisis center is, is open, but it's in Boulder, right? It's not, we, there's nothing here in Longmont uh, per se and, 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 and Jen, or what I think Jen, Jen did for the, the co-CEO did talk about, they do have, um, you know, phone and telemedicine services to help with this, um, but it's a challenge, right? It's a, it's a challenge. So here's some of the, some of the, the recommendations they said. Um, and I know that, that we did find out um, um, that mental health partners did get a grant recently to, to uh, create some teams to deal with the COVID um, uh, COVID 
impact on mental health. So that's going to be really great. And we're looking forward to see what that looks like. Karen Phillips and I were on that call. Um, and then around emergency housing, this is kind of what they said. I'm sorry, Alibato, can you go back? I didn't see all that. Okay, sorry, there you go. Um, so this local provision of 72 hours substance use, emergency commitment, substance use, involuntary commitment, or mental health holds. Right. Okay. That's what they recommended, is it? We, all right. Yeah. And then on the, on the emergency housing crisis services, they talked about increasing local capacity for emergency overnight, domestic violence shelter, um, and I'm not sure where a safe shelter is right now, and emergency overnight shelter for families who lose their homes. Um, I mean, I, I'm not sure what the waiting list for EFA is. We do have a shelter here in Longmont um, that EFA provides, but it's always had a wait list, so that's a challenge, right? The, the, there is a gap. And EFA and the um, cell vouchers, but it's a growing challenge as, as families start, um, you know, in this time of crisis, losing homes. So that was part of the recommendations. Also on the digital inclusion, they talked about marketing. Uh, and, I know, and I know NextSite is working on this, the Longmont, owned, Longmont Community Owned Broadband Service. Um, I know next slide is working on this and trying to get it out and they want to, you know, they, they recommend making sure that we can, you know, work with our, you know, like older adults, like uh, Shakita was saying, and with our families uh, with limited English proficiency and I, that is happening um, and, and I think it will continue to happen. So some of these recommendations we're actually working on already, um, for ex you know, and then they talk about a, a community, um, a digital inclusion strategy. I'm not sure that's happening, but we are working on uh, addressing the digital divide. Um, and we want, I think that some of this is something that we should look deeper into. Then in the case management piece, it really is around how do we build, the recommendation is to build capacity, you know, in, by increasing things like peer coaches or community navigators. And I, and I know HHS has navigators now. Um, Again, I'm not sure where we fit into this. This is a little bit bigger than Longmont. Uh, and I think HHS is trying to build capacity. Um, and so it's a good recommendation, but does it fit with what we do? I'm not so sure. Um, I mean, we can discuss it. Um, but it is something that, that I think we all recognize is an issue. Uh, in, in our community and in actually the broader in Boulder County. And I think there are some of those services. They're just kind of, there are some through human services, some through mental health partners, and some through the police department. Um, right. Yeah. So, ooh, and this does not look really good because I put it in as a picture. Uh, before we go to this, any, any other questions or thoughts on the, um, uh, on the on the, the human services needs assessment presentation, and then we'll jump into this. Not the presentation, but I. The more I read, I'm just really worried about what's going to happen to our seniors and our families um, for housing this winter. I mean, there just isn't anything. We kind of piecemeal it together, but what happens if we have just huge amounts of people that have no place to go. That worries me. Yeah, I agree with Anne and the, uh, the digital divide for our seniors as well. I mean, especially the ones who, what happens if they can't afford their nursing homes or their facilities that they're in? Um, what happens, what happens to them? And then also with the, digital divide, um, the reason why I'm thinking about them is because during COVID, so many families couldn't even visit them if they were in nursing homes or certain facilities or in the hospital. But if they had a device like an iPad or something like that, then they can actually see their family besides just talking to them. Because I can only imagine um, what kind of 
you know, what they, what was going on in their heads. You can't see your family, um, the same people every day, you know. So um, have we even thought about that, you know, making sure that our seniors are able to see their families across the, the U.S. because some seniors are here and their kids are elsewhere. And just the digital divide is just so huge now. I mean, just for me, trying to learn how to do all of this at my age, you know, I spun out for about six weeks just trying to figure it all out. Um, and it's definitely gotten easier, but it is difficult. And for seniors or people that just like English isn't really their first language, that is a huge barrier. Yeah, I think, I think it is a challenge. And I think that uh, I know our senior services are working with that. Our children, youth and families are working with that. Um, that is a part of their reality. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely acknowledge that it is a challenge. Um, and I also, I mean, the, the, the other part of it is what, what is the role of this, of this board and, and, and in particular the human part of why we, we have the, the needs assessments. I guess I'd just like to know if it's not part of our duties to really figure out this wave of people that could potentially be on the streets. Does our city council have any ideas? I don't know, it's kind of like COVID in general. It's like we're kind of never out in front of it, we're always behind it. Well, that. <laughs> <I'm carrying it laughs> that <one. laughs> well, yeah, yeah, Mister, stay silent. Um, we, you know, we are chasing it. There's, there is no doubt about that. Um, and I don't, you know, uh, we we do our best to try to get out in front of it, but it's 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 a beast. Um, so I would say, you know, I would say a couple of things. Um, you know, one. Uh, cer certainly, we will share this information with, uh, you know, with the city council and with other staff members that are involved in really tracking the impacts of, of COVID. They are, you know, we have staff that are tracking the various resources that are available that are coming down through the um, Fed of the state that could assist our community. Um, so, so I would say two things. One is it relates to the the. Uh, the digital divide. So we do have a uh, next slide on, on board and, and we're kind of, and we're starting. So certainly um, they're reaching out to the school district around the various um, low cost plans that are, you know, available. So, so they're offering um, and, and we'll do a follow up and we'll send out the, the flyer to the, advisory board members so you can get a, a list of the services and the cost for next light but there are um, so there's there's certainly the the gig internet service but they also are offering um, a lower speed for um, for a lower cost don't ask me what it is maybe it's like fourteen dollars a month or nineteen dollars a month so that still is a you know is a good resource um, but it, it's more, it, it might be more uh, affordable for, uh, for some of our lower income families. And, and so they are also working with the Lamont Community Foundation on Share the Next Light, which, um, which is, offers no cost um, internet access to, again, to, to low income households. So there's a variety of resources that we have um, put together and marketed to the, to the school district for, uh, for kids that are um, still gonna be virtual learning for a while. The other thing that we are focusing on too, as many of you know, is that the city of Longmont is, um, is, is now in strong partnership with the Longmont Housing Authority. And so we are bringing in, uh, next slide, and looking at a, a, a cost for making um, uh, internet services available uh, at a reduced cost to um, 
to the uh, to low income seniors that are living in our six housing authority um, community. So, so we are um, we are recognizing. I mean, it, it, it's very clear we're we're hearing that across the board, uh, just as you all have expressed about the uh, the impact of um, being in shutdown and how that has affected people's um, lives in terms of learning, in terms of connecting. Um, and we are trying to respond in um, in ways that provide more affordability and and also a free internet access. That's great to hear. May I throw in a, a, a question? Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Um, so if I remember the process correctly, when we've gone through this before, the needs assessment really helps us determine what the advisory board thinks the priorities are in terms of community need and how that will reflect on our funding priorities. Um, is, is that, do I have that correct in terms of what we're reviewing tonight? Yes, that is correct. Okay, thank you. So I, I think this conversation about the seniors and the digital divide, um, you know, part of what we may walk away with is also just some questions like Karen just did a great job answering. Uh, so I'm wondering, you know, just like in terms of, okay, well, what does this mean for seniors or something like that? Is there an opportunity to go back to the data gathered and ask for clarification on some of these questions that we may have about, you know, how does this trend specifically impact seniors or something like that? Hmm. I, I, I don't know, right? I, what comes to the top of my mind is would it be easier is to, to take this data and talk to, for example, our senior services staff mm -hmm. and say, mm -hmm. if they yeah. could shed some light on this, not necessarily going back to the data gathers root policy, uh, but, but have our senior services staff interpret the data. I, mean, I think that, that would probably be more likely it might get us yeah better analysis so yeah that that actually sounds exactly right now that i yeah. think about it because yeah. that they'll have more contextual kind right. of information to help us understand is our level of concern about something equal with theirs or is there additional information that may moderate something for on our side yeah and what i would add um brian is that I mean, I, I, I agree with Eli Berto that, that probably it's, it's going back to some of our uh, providers to help, you know, to help uh, further interpret some of this data and what we should be doing about it. I think we can also go back to the, um, to the to root policy because those were also some of the questions that they asked in the, in the focus groups. So here's, you know, here's what some of the data says. So what do you think we should do about it? So they might have additional information in their notes that they took um, that didn't make it to the report because the other you know, report was already 159 pages. Um, you know, so there, there could be additional um, data from their focus groups that, that could help shed a little additional light. So we could do both of those things. Okay. That's great, thank you. So my question was largely, uh, I think process oriented in terms of some of the, the clarity that the group might be seeking further down the line. Thank you. I have a question, if that's all right, Alberto. Yeah. Um, you know, I read, th I've, I read through, scan through it, and then hearing your report, it's sort of, you know, man, it's depressing, right? It seems terrible, it's sad. What do we do? And then I'm trying to tell myself, well, this is the first, maybe second one of these I've seen, right? Um, and so I'm curious from those of you who've sort of seen these year after year after year, what kind of magnitude of concern we should attach to it? Um, is this like, 
like a typical kind of report and it's it's bleak you know but it's always bleak or is it like no this is actually you know like what defcon level are we at for those of you who have more historical uh context i i think for me and i'll, I'll let karen answer she's seen more of these than i have um i've seen several of these i think what you're seeing is the difference in degree of challenges right challenges for low to moderate income families have always been there. Affordable housing has always been an issue in Longmont and Boulder. These are not new, but what you're seeing because of COVID um, is just how deep the problem is becoming. Um, and, and what you're seeing is an expansion of who's being faced with this problem, right? So for, for example, when I talk to the R Center, you know, I think I forget the exact percentage, but I mean, I think it was like 75% of the people that they've inter interviewed in the last three months had never used R Center services before, right? And so what this is, I don't think they're deeper, they're wider, and more people are being affected by them. So that to me is a scary part. Um, and I'm not sure, I mean, again, and, and again, and it, it might be out of this boards or Karen or eyes is, I'm not sure what some of the, the, the really so deep, long lasting solutions are, right? So what happens if we, if we don't return to normal for a long time and, you know, food service industry where many immigrants work, don't come back, right? Um, or, or child care providers if, if businesses close and you know so so that's the scary part to me is just how much broader and deeper and widespread uh, these challenges that we've always had uh, but now are just amplified to the nth degree because of COVID. And I would just echo that. Um, Eliberto said it, it well. You know, this is really actually only the second time that we, as a as a advisory board, have um, completed our own assessment. So usually, in in the past many many years, we have um, we basically have utilized uh, other assessments. So we have uh, really taken a look at the secondary data that has been um, developed by, you know, other entities and, and, and really looked at that to help us project our needs. So this is really the second time that we have, um, we have conducted our own needs assessment um, with primary data uh, collection. So, but, but I think Eliberto expressed it well, the, um, the impact of, of this pandemic and what it has done um, to people's livelihoods and to the economy and um, and the question of um, how we just really can't we're not seeing a light at the end of the tunnel in terms of bounce back and um, and, and bounce back is is going to be a new reality so some of these jobs may never come back so so just the the amount of time and the long duration of recovery that um, that we are likely to see is 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 of concern. You know, and you know, just as we were um, as we were considering going back um, and, and addressing some of our housing issues in the affordable housing arena, where we were talking about putting a, a, a sales tax increase on the on the ballot to raise more revenues to help us with creating more affordable units, you know, that's off the table, you know, and, um, and when will we be able to come back and, and, and look at additional resources to really help us address the housing issues? It, 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 it will be some time down the road. So it is depressing, Graham, uh, you know, concerning, uh, very uh, concerning in a, in a way that um, I don't think we have seen um, for that we have seen. Thank you both.
So if there are no other questions or other discussion, and we'll have more time for discussion, I just, um, but I, I'd like to go through uh, what, I, uh, what, I, what we drafted as far as a, a, a timeline for our funding process. And, um, and it's gonna be tight. I'm gonna be honest, it's gonna be a tight timeline. Um, but I, I, I think it is very doable and um, it is just, It'll, it'll just require us to, to um, step up a little bit our commitment and what we're going to do as a board um, and what, what we're going to do as staff. Um, so I'm going to go through that right now. And then we have time for more questions. So you're receiving the human service needs assessment right now. Um, you received it and, and we'll get you a final copy, a final version ASAP. Um, then I, I believe that we may need another meeting before we release the agency application. I guess what I should start saying is all these dates are arbitrary. I just put, I just, I just picked them, right? Except for tonight's meeting. Everything else is, um, is up for conversation. So I, I, I think we would need another meeting to finalize the priority or goal areas, um, which would then help me update the application and the instructions for the application. We, we, we really want to get, I guess the 9-11 the date uh, is, it, while it, I did pick it, it is, it, it's around there. We don't want to wait too long. Um, past that date to get it out, to give agencies um, a, a month to do that. And then during our October meeting, we would need to finalize our funding matrix uh, to, to, to more, um, for, in two areas. One, to uh, reflect what our goals are and also to reflect the changes in the application and the application evaluation. And we would receive those applications sometime in mid-October. And then we would have those last two or three weeks of October to start the review or to do our, our, our application review. And then we're thinking the first two weeks, you know, we, we have that depending on how the board wants to do the agency hearings, more than likely they'll be virtual, which may make it easier. I, I don't know. Um, and then we would deliberate at our December meeting. Uh, and then Karen and I and Brian would take it to the um, council in their, one of their January. I'm not sure if that's the correct, if that's a study or oh, I, I, I didn't check that. I just know it's a Tuesday, but we have to figure that out. And then once the council approves and I would start the agency contract process with Nicole uh, on 115. Um, and you know, and, and, and that's actually not too bad timing. Last year we started, Nicole and I started sending stuff out at the end of December and you know, people didn't get back to us till February or March. So I, I, I'm not too concerned about um, that January date. Really where, where I'm concerned about is, I think the, the, the hard work is really the prior, the getting those goal areas finalized the updating of the application and the funding matrix. And, and really for you, all the hard work is you got to review all those applications um, and setting up the, the hearings. So in, any thoughts or questions on the timeline? Really quick, uh, Alberto, just uh, Mr. Chair, or can you see the screen? Would it be helpful if I kind of just looked out for questions or stuff, or, or are you? But I, I do. Oh, yeah. I, or more a word of caution. Um, yeah, I mean, you're, we're talking about eleven days. It would be to get all of those applications turned around and reviewed. And and I know we have a lot of new folks on the board this year who haven't been through the process. And I've only done it once, so it's not like I'm an expert. But I will say, eleven days is is will be tight. Um, it's going to be tough, and I, I just want you know, you know, I, I know we have a lot of great people on the board, but I'm not, I'm not saying I'm against it. I understand that's what the timeline is. I just want to reiterate to somebody who's been through it, um, and I know Anne and and Brian and 
um, others can can speak to this as well. It, it's it's a tight timeline, and I think everybody being aware of that is is good as we head into this discussion. Yeah, um, I, I would just take a moment. I'm sorry to interrupt. I would just take a moment to um, to agree that it's you know it'll require discipline on our part. However. I'm also optimistic that some of the changes we're making to the questions in the application, uh, as well as you know matching with our evaluation, I think will also make evaluating the applications more straightforward and uh, possibly a little more intuitive, uh, in which case we may see some efficiencies there. And, and, and right now, the primary changes are in the evaluation. We've made it much more intuitive, much more aligned uh, with the application. Um, so I'm not sure, it, depending on where they go, I, I'm not sure if we're gonna change the questions much because once, once we, we started looking at, at the, combat, the evaluation in the application, we realized that the real issue wasn't the application. The real issue was the evaluation form. It didn't connect well. And so if you're reading it and you're trying to figure out what the question and where you find it, so I, I completely revamped the evaluation to really track the application and made the questions, the, the evaluation pieces much more simple and straightforward. That'll be really helpful, Alberto. Thank you for that. You know, the, the, the thing that I wonder, and, and, and obviously, we um, we have major holiday season in there in November. Um, so it, it, I too am concerned about that. That latter part of October is the is the time that we have to review all those applications. That that just doesn't give us a whole lot of time. Um, you know the the other. Um, option that we could consider is we um, we give ourselves a, a little more time to review the applications and you know we hold our funding hearings that first part of December the first couple of weeks in December or that first week in December or whatever um, and we deliberate in um, in, in our either in a special meeting in January or our regular meeting in January and take something back to city council to end their second meeting in January. And, um, you know, and, and then it might be that we are starting the contracting process, the, you know, the end of, you know, sending that out the end of January, 1st of February. You know, we can, we can, we can certainly, in terms of the contracts, we can get all the con the boilerplate contracts ready. So what takes the time um, is sorry, I have a bug in my office. <laughs> um, so what I think really takes the time is putting together the um, the customized scope of work for the contracts. We send it back to the agencies. They have to make sure that that's correct. So there's some back and forth. Um, and so I, I guess it's really how much time do you all need realistically to do your best work in reviewing the applications? And, and the trade-off is we start the contracting process, you know, a, a little bit later. So it might be we are hitting that heavy in February, end of January and throughout February. And Karen, I'm correct that there's no I guess uh, you've answered the question already, but there's no you know, hard deadline or reason that we would need to have stuff done by January 15th or anything. No, like no, I think the only thing, so because what happens is that uh, the, the council allocates the amount of, of funding that is uh, set aside for agencies. So they do that, they adopt the budget in um, October. So uh, so that's all done and and then and then it's really up to us to bring back, all right, so here's how we're recommending to allocate those, those funds. So I think it's really just about um, wanting to get funding out to the agencies as, as, as quickly as possible. But 
we, we still had some agencies that we were still negotiating, going back and forth and waiting for contracts to be signed yet in July. So, um, so, so yes, so there's, I think we want to allow ourselves enough time to do great work um, and really to uh, think through this process, but not certainly delay too much a contract offer agency so that we can start issuing the money. And, and just as a refresher, remind me how much time we had last year. Was it a month? Was it a full month that we had roughly last year? For a review, I, I think we probably had, without going back, I mean, I think we probably had a good three weeks, Yeah, three weeks to a month. Okay. So maybe, I mean, I'll just throw this out there. My thought would be if we could extend that application review period yeah. by about 10 days. Um, okay. And, and I mean, that would be my, just give about 10 more days for us to get through those applications um, and just kind of push the rest of the process back. I mean, I know that that runs us into, you know, right before you know, the Christmas holiday for that, that deliberation meeting, but, and people are in and out of town, but I guess that's the trade off. So I'll, I'll throw that out there and I, yeah, I, I, I can do that. I can, I can refigure this to give the board more time around the application review and also take into account Thanksgiving, Christmas, and um, yeah. But I guess my question is, I still think that, you know, I still think we'll, we'll need a special meeting later this month or early September to really um, – you know, um, finalize those goal areas. Uh, Karen and I are going to have a follow-up conversation with Root on some of their outcome measures, and that might help that we, you know, we could send out once we get that, that might help uh, us deliberate that. Um, but we just need to decide, you know, are, are we keeping what we have and we're just rearranging? Are we adding, um, are we, you know, so, so yeah, those, those are kind of my questions to the board. You know what we have, you know, we have those six priorities. We can always rearrange those priorities, you know, in the percentages that we have. You know, are we adding digital divide? Are we adding something around seniors in particular? So all of those are the questions that I have um, that we need to figure out together. Can I just chime in to say that I think that it would be better to add a special board meeting if we're going to save some time to do other things like review applications. I'd rather put in an extra special board meeting now instead of delaying that process. So I think that makes sense. I support the extra board meeting as well. And particularly on this uh, needs assessment issue. And it's a really big question. And I think having uh, it a little fresher on our minds for that discussion. So meaning not as much time goes by, you know, an entire month. I, I think we will benefit from that as well. And I'm certainly willing to put in the extra time. So I had, I guess I just had 20 seconds. I know Karen's going to be out. So I'd rather do it with Karen here. Um, so I'm good with whatever the group works for, for everybody else. I can make it work. So, so I guess, you know, we, we have the, um, so, so either we're talking about trying to have a meeting this, this following week or, um, or sometime, you know, September 1st, 2nd, or or third, right, you know, before the Labor Day weekend. So I don't know if people have generally preferences or if you want Nicole to send out um, a, a doodle poll. A doodle poll would be great. Um, only because, I mean, I'm, as I'm looking at my calendar, I, I'm, I'm in a grad school program now and student teaching and running around a thousand different places. So I'm, right. I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I would love a doodle poll just to get the chance to compare options and whatever works for the most people I will endeavor to be at for sure. Okay. 
All right, so I think, I think Alberto, then we will circle. Uh, you know, I can, um, you know, talk to Nicole tomorrow and, and throw and put, identify some, some dates and, and get that poll out um, tomorrow. So that's basically what I had. Unless anybody has any more questions um, about the human service assessment, that's 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 the end of my presentation. Does anybody else have questions on uh, the on the priorities? And I know you'd mentioned that. Did we did we cover that? Okay, over time. Okay. I think that'll be part of what we we talk about in our special meetings. Right. Gotcha, that clears that up for me. Thank you. So, Alberto, you can take down your, your slides. All right, I'm going to stop sharing and go back. Okay. To the, go back to Jake and Brian. To Brian, are you taking this? Uh, Jake, if if you could still do it, that'd be great. I'm I'm close to my computer, but I'm at still at a disadvantage. No worries. Hold on. Give me one second just to pull up the agenda real quick because I, I did take it down to take notes. So give me just one moment here. My apologies. So next okay. is the site visit updates. That's right. Thank you so much. Our next uh, item on our agenda are site visit updates. First is Longmont Meals on Wheels. That is a member Woodley who is absent tonight. So after that would be uh, the in-between. Uh, Board Member Abbott, are you able to uh, talk to us a little bit about the in-between? Hi, sure. Um, first of all, it feels like it has been forever since I actually did this. Sure it has. <laughs> Before COVID hit, I think it was actually the week um, <laughs> The week, uh, it was the day before our last actual in-person meeting that I that I was there meeting with them. So um, forgive me a little bit if, um, if I'm a little rusty. Um, I do have some notes, but it's, uh, you know, making sense of my own, own notes there. Um, the in-between provides um, supportive housing in Longmont. Um, and one of the big things um, that we spent um, a decent amount of, amount of time talking about was um, the recent completion of the Micah Homes project, um, which is the small um, sort of permanent um, affordable housing that's next to the United Church of Christ off of 9th um, here in Longmont. Um, at the time that we visited, they had um, done initial, addition, uh, sorry, initial reviews for occupancy, um, but we're having to go back and redo some things around landscaping and drainage around it um but they were getting ready to have folks move in and they were really really excited about sort of the cross um community effort that went into um getting that project up and going um my sense is that it's one of the first of its kind in longmont if not the first um Alberto, you might have a little bit more information on that. Um, and so along the way, they were in some of these um, guinea pigs for figuring out some of the um, processes. The, the big thing that um, Tim, the executive director, um, brought up was that um, they, they aren't um, contractors, they aren't builders, and yet they were in the position of essentially being contractors and builders here and having to go through things like permitting and he was like you know some of this stuff probably makes sense to people who do this and for us it was like I don't know uh, and so like at, at various points they just sort of felt like they were sitting and waiting and didn't know what to do or they weren't sure how to keep things moving along um, and that what was being asked of them from uh, the permitting office they weren't always 100% sure how, how to deal with that. And, um, and so that seemed to me, um, that, that was the biggest challenge they identified. Like they were super excited about Micah Homes and all that had gone into it. And then they were like, it's great, the city was supporting us, but then we sort of felt like we were in this like limbo place um, with permitting and all of that. Um, 
So, um, you know, a lot of what they, so that project has taken up a lot of what they're doing. And at the time they were sort of weighing whether they were gonna get another piece of property to do another type of project. They were looking at that. They had, um, the executive director had met with some folks to, to see about that. And he was sort of like, I don't know if we want to get into this business, but it feels like a big success on top of sort of the, the other work that we're doing. Um, most of their work up until this point has really been transitional housing. Um, and so really um, having things that are affordable, helping people get off their feet. So they have caseworkers that work with residents in their um, facilities to help them get, um, have a plan for moving on. Um, so I think I, this I, I cannot um, <laughs> decipher from my notes. I think they said the average stay is about 15 months um, for folks there. Um, I would anticipate that, um, and, and they always have a waiting list. I'm anticipating that that is even bigger now with COVID um, and that that average stay is not going to stay at 15 months. Um, a lot, you know, a lot of what we talked about as well was that, you know, the caseworkers are there um, to help folks access other services if they need them, um, but also to help them. Um, I think they described it as sort of like mindset shifting for a lot of folks um, to think about like, what would it take for me to be successful in obtaining like long term housing that's affordable. Um, and, you know, there are some folks that have just, like, it's just such a struggle to even get to there, to the in-between, that, you know, sometimes it can, they start out and they just, they just need some time. They just need some time to get their heads on. They need some time to feel like the rug isn't going to be pulled out from under them. And I think um, what I heard really strongly was, um, deeply caring about residents and what they, they needed to get to move through, um, while also recognizing that, you know, people can't stay there forever. It's transitional housing and they, they, they're trying to balance that of like, what is this person needed? How can we empower them without um, infantilizing or um, sort of letting them, uh, they didn't use this term, but like wallow um, the, like not letting folks stagnate there and really using it as a jumping off point. Um, and I think they really take that seriously and figuring out what that looks like for each, each person and, or each family that's there rather than saying everyone has to be out within a certain period of time. They customize that, they figure it out, they help provide a plan and they help that person create the plan. So, um, yeah, uh, and I guess the last thing I want to mention is that um, they are they are trying to get better at gathering data around um, their work. They um, they do have data. They shared information about like sort of that average stay, um, how um, how much how many folks they move through, um, but they recognize like they don't have a staff member that's dedicated to um, doing data. It's sort of like a little bit of a whole bunch of people's jobs to, to figure out like what data all their various funders might need, all of their you know board members need. And so um, they, they definitely feel like they're hearing that they need to have more data and they were trying to figure out how to make sure that they get that without you know sort of being like, we have to hire somebody specifically to do data because everybody wants data and everybody wants something slightly different. Um, and so that, that seems like a little bit of a challenge, but also something that they are trying to just sort of take a little bit at a time and improve upon as they can, um, rather than feeling like they have to like solve it all at once. And that's all I have. So, uh, from my desk audit, I mean, on the business side of it, um, you know, um, I was actually part of their, right before COVID, I was invited to a panel um, to discuss with their board, because their board is going through strategic planning. 
And so I was, I was there to discuss just kind of what, what the trends that we're seeing in, in Longmont. Um, so I know that they're doing that. You know, overall, again, most of the agencies are doing pretty well um, as far as the, the business end of it. Um, you know, they have two Latinos on the board, which is great. Um, you know, my, my suggestion to most of these, because most of these folks have some type of nomina nomination process. And I always, you know, I always tell them, you know, think about as, I know that you're committed to diversity. You need to spell it out in your, in your, in your process, right? If you institutionalize it in the process, it will help you in it. Because they do have, a, they, they have a very well laid out process and, and, and it does what typical processes do. It talks about the, you know, the different skill sets needed and that's fine. That, that's all part of, 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 of a board uh, nomination process. You need specific skill sets on a nonprofit board, you know, folks that are good with accounting and finance and et cetera. And I said, I, I told Tim, uh, the, the ED, and think about adding a, a, a specific statement around diversity and inclusivity. That'll just help you, even though I know you're committed, I know the people that are on your board, they're committed to it. Um, this, will just, this will just make sure that it becomes ingrained in the work you do. So, so yeah, and they have a good annual report um, as well. Um, so overall, I, I found not, not any real issues with, with the in-between. I think one thing too is that they actually have one spot on their board, um, Ellie Bertrand, correct me if I'm wrong, that is for a uh, someone who has utilized their services. So they actually have one person who is, um, you know, has utilized their services in the past and so it's part of that board. Um, I, I believe so. Question, if I may. It's your meeting, Brian. Go for it, Mr. Chair. I, th I thought you were going to take us home, Jake. I thought you were going to take us all the way in. I can if you'd like to, but I saw you pop back in, so it's all. No, you no. Uh, you you take us you take us home. I'm here as a, just a participant. Um, so, what are your thoughts? What does staff have thoughts on these questions about, you know, uh, getting diverse representation on a board, for instance, can be challenging or it feels challenging. And, and I think some of the issues that we're starting to understand is, is like the language that we use in the application or the uh, channels through which we send it out. Or, you know, there, there are various things that, uh, like I don't, I'm not aware that are creating barriers. Is there, um, any, any thoughts on resources that we can offer to our partners to help them through some of those questions, like even paid resources, like how to evaluate an application to make sure that it does, it is friendly to everybody. So, you know, I know CAP is still doing its pro. In fact, they just started their Pearl 10, I'm not sure what they're calling it now. But I know CAP is still doing its work around increasing diversity on boards and commissions. Uh, they've been doing that for years. Um, I think Belinda is a new person doing that. And, and so, so they're doing that work. You know, and Rita is doing it through the Community Foundation, doing their work. I know LMAC, I'm not, actually, I'm not sure what LMAC is doing, to tell the truth. But, um, but yeah, there, there are resources out there, Brian. Um, and, and it's really you know, how do we share those resources? I know CAP is getting the word on social media. Um, um, so yeah, it's, 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 it's getting people interested and committed. Like I told, like I told Tim, I think, I think the in-between is committed and you just got to institutionalize it. You got to make it, you got to make sure that it is always there. It's not, you know, it's, it's something that you see and you read um, every time you look at the nominating process, every time a committee says, well, it's time to look for new board members. It's part of the list of here's what's important to us. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions uh, from the board on the in between site visits? I have a comment. Go ahead, Greg. Uh, it would sure be great if the city building department could help make it easier for nonprofits to do their work. And uh, I'm wondering if. 
we could send them an email to say, hey, it'd be great if you could consult with, you know, a nonprofit who's trying to, to build a project, you know, like it's, it's just, yeah, that's my comment. I am very happy to report and I, um, that we, you actually, uh, the Housing and Human Services Advisory Board has uh, utilized or allocated uh, CDBG funds to, to, uh, to fund what we call a planning facilitator to do exactly what you just talked about, Graham. Um, and so, uh, because if you are a, a nonprofit developer, um, this is not, you know, this is not your, your wheelhouse. And so, um, so we have, I think what happened is that in between their MICA project uh, was a little ahead of when we brought the uh, planning facilitator on board. So um, we have found that um, that planning facilitator has been very helpful. They have worked with other small nonprofit developers of affordable housing um, to help them uh, really get through the, um, you know, that, that planning and, and permit process. So, um, so yay, I have a solution. <laughs> so, because it is daunting. It, it, it is. And, uh, and so we, we did put that in place, uh, you know, a, a couple of years ago and um, it was funded it a couple of years ago. And I think we've had that planning facilitator for about a year and we want to continue that. Um, may I ask a question? As a is um, I, it, it sounds like they were um, just ahead of that. Um, or they were like far enough in the process that they didn't know it was there for this sort of like ending piece when they had like some of this final permitting. Um, I don't know if they have actually suspended um, like sort of their plans to look for another project, um, but it might be helpful or useful. Um, I, and I'm happy to do it. I don't know if it's appropriate or if his staff could do it is to reach out to Tim and let him know like that this was actually something that, you know, we brought back up. Um, as part of this and that we do have that um, and, sort of and what it would and what it would say Caitlin is is Tim is aware of this okay. um, and um, you know and, and you know the in-between received a hundred thousand dollars from a pot of money I don't remember was affordable housing fund and you know we we <laughs> basically recommended that and um, so I don't know if that's what you are talking about um, but I think they have identified um, purchase of an existing property that they are um, that they are, are considering versus you know developing from the, the ground up. But absolutely, we will connect them in with resources that would be available to help them with their next, whether it's an acquisition or um, or a construction project. Awesome. Ken, uh, would it be possible to have staff just check in on because I I remember that conversation very well in uh, in TRG because there was quite a bit of contention about giving money for a, a, a TBD property so if uh, at like 30 would be super helpful uh, just for my memory's sake okay yeah that, that that's a recent update that we just heard um, okay. you know so that that's 30 seconds. Okay. <laughs> so I don't have anything more, but I know, I, I know that, yeah. So okay. we can probably give that update like next, yeah, next month. That would be awesome. That'd be great. Okay, anything else on the in-between from the board? Raise hands, I'm looking for raised hands. I see none. Okay, Caitlin and Alberto, thank you very much for that. Next up, uh, board member Phillips is gonna talk to us a little bit about the Recovery Cafe. Karen, do we have, Karen, you're, you're muted. I think Karen's gonna say, cause I just realized that I don't have anything on the Recovery Cafe. No, it, it, it happened right when the COVID thing started. And so it was a, you know, we had to cancel it and it was before they did any. Yeah. Zoom, you know, that kind of, yeah. Thing. Okay. of course, you know, know, if Karen, if you're up to it, we want we just did the mental health partners and that was a really good one yeah you want to do that one 
All right, we can do chair. Can we do the partners? Is that okay to do the mental partners? Would that be okay with study? Is that good, Nicole? I don't know what kind of records we're keeping on these things, but would that be yes, okay? That's totally fine with me. I think that sounds fine, particularly if it's fresh. <laughs> yeah, it's fresh is good. Karen, <laughs> take take it away on mental health partners. So well, I don't know where to start, but um, there's they're involved in so many things. Um, they have like 370 employees. I don't know about how all the rest of these things that we fund, but um, they go hand in hand with a lot of different people and there, there's so many programs. Um, they have relief funds, they have partnerships with everybody. As far as like Longmont goes, uh, we discussed a little bit about, um, they, have, they have 11 board members and there's one member that's on the, as in Longmont. So that's cool. And then they're planning on getting two more board members, but they're going to go and make sure that it's diversity type folks. So that they're needing two of those people, but they just, you know, involve themselves in mental health. Um, they just joined the NAACP and are trying to recruit staff with that kind of thing in mind. So, um, they have like 20 grants they're working on. I mean, they're, they're just really involved everywhere. And um, they have a wellness center and uh, Sherman Wellness Center. But like we had said, the, the uh, Boulder County, um, it's in Boulder and not here in Longmont, uh, that 24 hour thing. And um, I asked them about, uh, you know, the turnover, how are they working with turnover because that mental health service is a big turnover and they have a committee that's working on that and trying to figure out employee engagement so people will stay because I know the big thing with mental health is clients get someone and then they move on and it's kind of a problem. So they're aware of that. They're aware of a lot of things. Um, A lot of different uh, funding sources. I asked them about if they're involved with the police department here, but apparently Eliberto told me that uh, they're not involved, but another mental health organization is involved with the police. And they're trying to work on the homeless, but like I said, again, it's more of a bolder thing. And we had said, you know, they're trying to work with Longmont to get a little bit more Longmont help because they realize that people in Longmont don't want to go to Boulder to, to deal with things. The other thing that the good thing that come out of COVID is that they were saying they're doing a lot of online things and that's kind of been working out because a lot of times people have a hard time with transportation. So that that's been kind of one of the good things about the COVID, but it does kind of work because they can do it over the phone and that kind of thing. So I thought that was kind of interesting. a lot of different people. I asked them how many programs they had, but they it was a lot. They didn't quite zone in on exactly where that was. They're trying to do the co-responder model, which I'm not quite sure what that is. And oh, also there was another wellness center. Um, there's one, oh, at the hub, and then there's one uh, wellness center on um, Sherman Avenue. South Sherman, so people can go there. And I asked her how people find out about this, and you know, it's word of mouth. And uh, I was kind of confused about, you know, they involve so much, and I know a lot of people that are in the welfare and the police and courts and things like that. They find to go to the Boulder Mental Health, but they're a nonprofit, and they don't—they're not a government agency, so they work with other people but of course they could use as much money as they could because of the fact that it's mental health and uh, kind of that's what i got to say how about you Alberto? so you know a couple i'll, I'll do the the i love it and i'll talk a little bit about some other stuff that I've, I've learned recently um and what we learned from the 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 conversation so on the business I, what i found interesting
interesting was they actually had a finding in their audit um, around internal control. Now, I've seen quite a bit of audits and, uh, and you know, internal control issues are typically for small agencies. If you're, if you're a small nonprofit, yeah, you're always gonna get that finding because the reality is you don't have the amount of staff to institute the kind of internal control procedures that to not get it, right? Um, that's, if, you, if you're a small agency doing audit, more than likely you will find an internal control finding, right? You just don't have the money to pay receivable accounts payable. You just don't, don't have that kind of, of really, but for an agency that size to receive that finding, I found that a little surprising. And so we discussed it and Jen talked about, you know, they have addressed it. You know, it was, it was a culture issue. It was just, um, it was just how, how they were set up. Um, and so they in, in, instituted more checks and balances, which is great. Um, so I, I, I found that just interesting. Uh, you know, for, uh, on the business side, like, like, and you see that side that has the, 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 the resources that they do on paper, they, they, they got it all, right? They got all the correct uh, documentation. I mean, of course, they're, they're, hit, they're, they're a mental health healthcare provider, so all the HIPAA rules, et cetera. So they, got, they, they, they check all the boxes. What's interesting, though, it, it, it is challenging the work they do. Um, I know that um, they just, so one thing they mentioned is they got the big grant to create these teams uh, to provide mental health support because of COVID and the isolation that's happening. So we're not sure exactly what that's going to look like at this point. They're, they're, it's a SAMHSA grant, and SAMHSA is the Substance Abuse Mental Health Assault, uh, Agency. It's a federal grant. Uh, so they got this big grant to do that. Uh, they're one of the few in the state. Um, you know, they've been dealing with the Medicaid reimbursement piece, right? There was, there were, I mean, they were threatened to, Medicaid was threatening to not reimburse phone. They only telemedicine. And so that was an issue because a lot of their clients don't have internet internet access, and thus they, they do it by phone, right? Uh, and and I don't think I don't think they told us where they ended up on that, uh, but they were able to. What they said is they've really been expanding their services uh, just because, you know, their clients need basic need support, and so they've been providing phones, for example, and they've been doing some other things, providing food or whatever, uh, employment services, stuff that they not is not necessarily in their wheelhouse. But like many agencies, they need to provide right now because it's just a huge need. Uh, I just found out yesterday, and I'm pretty excited about this, um, which are kind of like navig mental health navigators more than anything. I don't think they're therapists. They're more like navigators to mental health services. And they're now going to be at Hope uh, during, during the Hope uh, overnight shelter. They're also even going to be at the Safe Lot. So I think that's a that's a good thing. They weren't they they've always been at the Boulder Shelter, but they've never been to Karen. You know they they haven't been a whole bunch in Longmont, but they're trying. So I'll give them that much that they're trying. But it, it's a challenging, challenging uh, service area, and and uh, definitely they they recognize that, that they have a they that they have a lot of work to do. I think Jen did a good job of saying that. So that's that my piece. That's great. Any questions or thoughts from the board on mental health partners? Uh, Mr. Chair, go for it. Thank you. Alberto, uh, I'm curious, when you look at something like financial controls, does the city of Longmont have specific standard procedures that you're benchmarking against? No, these are so so. There's, what's it called? The FASB, the or the GAP. The, the, yeah, yeah. You know, the, the generally accountable. And again, I'm I am not a CPA, so I'm not I'm not necessarily. It's GASB. GASB. There we go. I'm not necessarily diving deep into the audit, and, and that's not my role. Yeah. But when I see something like a significant finding or significant deficiency or whatever, I I know enough to be dangerous. Um, and I know, I know what some of these things, you know, the, the big thing is if you have a material weakness, that's where you, that's where you get really scared or really worried. Um, mm -hmm. but a significant deficiency is just, Hey, you're, you're lacking here. It, it, that's kind of what a CPA told me once. It's like, you know, significant deficiency is, is, is important, but it's not a material weakness. So 
So yeah, we, we don't have specific standards, but there are specific standards out there. Yeah, okay, thank you. You know, the other thing I wanted to say is they, they would turn away no one. You know, they're, they're always gonna find someone, some way to help somebody as long as they can, the people, the clients can come in and find out about them. But they would find a way to help finance and all that kind of thing. So they, they don't turn anyone away. And I think that was cool. That's great. That's great. Anything else from the board on mental health partners? Don't see anything. Okay, Karen, thank you so much. That was your first site visit presentation, That's right? Well, great job. Thank you so much for that. We really appreciate it. Uh, and hopefully we'll be able to catch Madeline at some point in the future with uh, the, the Meals on Wheels one. So, okay, moving on to item number six on our agenda tonight, a check-in regarding uh, the discussions we had in July and next steps. Karen, is this you? Kind of. <laughs> so, so we just... We just, uh, when we looked at the minutes, uh, we reviewed the minutes, and one of the things that we said is that we were just going to um, uh, bring back and, and really have a discussion with Polly, who is, is not with us this evening. <laughs> so, um, so obviously what you did tonight is you adopted the minutes from our special conversation on July 23rd, I believe which mm -hmm. has a lot of detail in there about our, our conversation, um, um, about equity. And, um, and so I think we were gonna just check in with Polly to see what else that she might need from us. I believe that was the, um, that was the recommendation in the, in the mm -hmm. minute. So um, I, I know that it, it would have been the, the, the Tuesday after we had our special meeting that, um, you know, that council member Christensen did make a comment in the, um, at the council meeting and council comments about the um, Housing and Human Services Advisory Board's conversation um, and, um, and that her recommendation was to continue to bring back the conversation um, about the Lama Police Department and the policies and procedures as it relates to, to use of force. So I also happen to know that the um, that the city manager did reach out and have a follow-up conversation with um, you know with Polly, and are working on bringing forward that um, that information for that discussion with council. I just don't know exactly when that's going to happen. Okay. I I think what might be good here is if I just put it out to the board and see if there's any thoughts that folks have just quick follow ups um, from last month. And then, you know, I have a thought if no one else does. Does anyone else have a thought that they might want to add or, or any, any follow ups? Mr. Chair, go ahead. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so the, uh, the complication of the issue has not left us despite the the month that we've had since the last meeting. And I just wanted to reiterate a little bit of, of where I was kind of left, which is the, uh, you know, thinking, trying to make sure we really thought through carefully that we're not conflating issues. So for instance, uh, policing is one issue, funding is another issue, and how are we specifically, what is our expectation for funding, for instance? Um, I think, in, for me at least, I feel like many of those, uh, there are still questions on the table in terms of how do we as a body represent the community in a way that reflects these new understandings and this new momentum and those kinds of uh, issues. Um, I also, I guess part of the reason that I, I'm talking about this is because I also think about our needs assessment. And I've been having these kinds of conversations on other boards. And 
you know, one of the things that we realized, for instance, is that the issues that have arisen over the last three months were not represented in our strategic plan. Uh, so in, in that case, we have a strategic plan that drives what we do. We don't have a, uh, a needs assessment. But it, it makes me think about, so we're going back and modifying strategic plans. And so all of this is to say, I think as we consider our next conversation, there may be, um, a, you know, that needs assessment may tie into some of the, the energy on the board in terms of how do we affect change. Sorry, that was a really rambling way to say that. But. No, that's, that, that makes sense. It's a great thought. Anyone else have a thought to, to piggyback off of? Yeah. Well, you know, in the needs assessment, there was, you know, some comments about from low income people about the police. So it's, it's addressed in there somewhat. I thought. It's certainly an important conversation as part of the moment. And, and I appreciate, first of all, just another acknowledgement of how you know, proud I was to be a member of this board last month and, and the conversations that we had. Um, I, I would like to, to just maybe ask if we could follow up, if staff could follow up the email with uh, Councilmember Christensen just about anything she might need and just communicate that back to us. Um, that would be helpful just in layer of a more in-person conversation in this meeting tonight. Um, that'd be the only thing that, that I would think, because really what, what we did at the last meeting, if the minutes and my recollections are correct, essentially say, you know, we want to see, have this, see this conversation happen and that's how we take the lead. So, um, does that sound okay to everybody? General? Okay. Anyone else have anything on this? Okay, I don't see anybody, so I will go ahead and uh, move on, if that's okay, to any other business that we might have tonight. Any business that anyone has to raise? Speak now, forever hold your peace. I see none. Okay, with that, uh, thank you all so much. I will entertain a motion to adjourn our meeting for tonight, if I have it. Do I have a motion? I move to adjourn the meeting tonight. Do I have a second? I second. All right. Week. Fantastic. Uh, all in favor? Yeah. Okay. All right. all right. We are adjourned. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. This is all you next time. So appreciate Thank it. You all. Thank, Thank you. you all Thank you. Hi. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you all.